The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and also with you. Let us pray. O God, you give us your Son as the vine, apart from whom we cannot live. Nourish our life in his resurrection, that we may bear the fruit of love, and know the fullness of your joy, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading for today is from Acts chapter 8. An angel of the Lord said to Philip, Get up and go toward the south, to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So he got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian, Enoch, a court official of the Candace, of the queen of the Ethiopians. He was in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home, seated in his chariot. He was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go over to this chariot and join it. So Philip got up and ran and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, do you understand what you are reading? He replied, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now, the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb, silent before its shearer. So he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The Enoch asked Philip, About whom may I ask you? Does the prophet say this about himself or about someone else? Then Philip began to speak, and starting with this scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the Enoch said, Look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip and the Enoch, went down to the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The Enoch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he was passing through the region, he proclaimed the good news to all the towns 
until he came to Caesarea. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The second reading is from 1 John. Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. 
Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him, and he is in us, because he has given us of his Spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father has sent his Son as the Savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and they abide in God. So we have known and believed that love that God has sent for us. God is love, and those who abide in love ab abide in God, and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. Those who say, I love God, and hate their brothers or sisters, are liars, for those do not have or love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this, those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. Word of God, word of life, thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. It was never my intention to build a camp, and it was just my intention to help support the pediatric AIDS program. Uh, I was a pediatric immunologist at UC Med Center, and we were seeing very rare immunodeficiency disorders. And as we were studying the young men uh, with AIDS, uh, we saw a child that looked like uh, the child had the same immunologic profile, and it turned out to be the first blood transfusion associated AIDS child. There was a lot more to learn about HIV and AIDS, and Art was just that guy you could sit down and have a cup of coffee with, and he made it in layman's terms so I could understand it. In 1991, which was the worst year from my perspective, I had nine kids die in one year. That was incredibly tough, and that was around the time that I heard from Elaine Taylor. She called me out of the blue and she said, and she said, I'm willing to put money and energy and time to raise money for programs that take care of kids with HIV. What can you tell me about care in the Bay Area? Elaine said, what do you need to make the program work? And I told her what I needed. I needed solid support so I could spend my time focusing on the needs of the kids and the families. And the needs of the kids and the families were huge. You know, with children only dying and no reports of long-term survival and a lot of struggles and terrible stigma, these families were in horrible, horrible pain. 50% of all funds went to Children's Hospital Oakland for their pediatric AIDS program. And then the other 50% went to the camp programs and urgent needs and social settings, everything from Friday fun days to Christmas parties, to all the things that these children with AIDS were not getting. It wasn't long before Elaine and Barry realized they wanted to do so much more. So, in 1997, they partnered with the East Bay Regional Park District to build Camp Arroyo, a state-of-the-art green facility. 
The camp opened in 2000, but by then, the transmission rate of HIV from mother to child dropped dramatically. So the Taylor Family Foundation was faced with a good problem. And so we decided that we would help children with illnesses and disabilities that fell between the cracks, that there was no program for, and that they were not nationally funded or federally funded. And so because of that, we now have 32 programs. <laughs> so there's a lot. What were some of the surprises that came from opening this camp up to kids with all sorts of disabilities? I think it was the, it was the adults we spoke to that would say, it's free. And I would say, yes, it, it's free, no charge. We will take care of that. Growing to 32 programs required a lot more fundraising. Friends like Steve Rivera of Diablo Magazine helped raise awareness. Where I actually get really warm in, in my heart is when I think about Barry and Elaine and the journey. I know the challenges that they went through in that journey, sometimes really tough, yet here 25 years later, you know, look at what they have to show for it. Barry Taylor passed away in 2013, but the vision of the Taylor Family Foundation lives on. Elaine wouldn't have it any other way. Barry Taylor would be so excited to be at the 25th anniversary of this because neither one thought it was going to be more than a two or three year, you know, agreement that we would do a fundraiser in our backyard. So wherever he is, he's going to be probably more proud than I'm going to be because we are at our 25th year and we, this thing is still moving like a big, heavy-duty locomotive. We should celebrate 25 years, because it's 25 years of blood, sweat, and tears, you know, it really is, and I've seen you do it. Imagine Jesus standing in the middle of a Palestinian vineyard holding a grapevine in his hand when he looks out upon the crowd gathered and says, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. If ever there were a story curated for Livermore, it's this story. We are surrounded by lush vineyards, so we should automatically understand what Jesus is communicating in this story. So what exactly is he trying to say, residents of Livermore? It seems quite straightforward, right? Jesus is the vine, God is the gardener, and we who are Christ followers are the branches. Our task, bear fruit. God's task, prune us to make us more fruitful. Now, many sermons have been preached on the ways in which God, in fact, prunes people. I don't know about you, but the idea of being pruned has never been very attractive to me. I mean, doesn't pruning mean cutting back and amputating vines and branches? That doesn't sound like something I'd willingly volunteer to be a part of. And I get that pruning is necessary. We have to cut off the dead parts of a branch so that the whole vine or tree can thrive. Pumping resources into something that is dead is a diversion of necessary resources for vines that are still very much alive. Still, who wants to experience the heavenly pruning shears cutting back the dead spots in our lives? Part of me would just rather take the whole vine down with me. Then I notice there is another way to think about this passage. Bible scholars tell us that the Greek phrase for prunes also can mean to clean. This makes so much more sense when we continue reading the next verse in this story. Let me read the two verses together, substituting cleans for prunes, so you will see what I mean. Christ says, He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit He cleans, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Author Bruce Wilkinson tells about a man who approached him at a pastor's conference once on the West Coast. The man asked, do you understand what John 15 is all about? Not completely, Wilkinson answered. Why, the man asked. I think I can help you. See, I own a large vineyard in Northern California, and I think I have it figured out. Wilkinson says he offered to buy the man a cup of coffee on the spot. 
As the two sat across the restaurant from one another, the table from one another, the man began to talk about his life as a grower, the long hours spent walking the vineyards, tending the grapes, watching the fruit develop, waiting for the perfect day to begin the harvest. New branches have a natural tendency to trail down and grow along the ground, this vineyard owner explained, but they don't bear fruit down there. You see, when branches grow along the ground, the leaves get coated in dust, and when it rains, they get muddy, and when they're muddy, they mildew. The branch then becomes sick and useless and ultimately dies. What do you do? Wilkinson asked. Cut it off and throw it away? Oh no, the man exclaimed. The branch is much too valuable for that. Instead, we go through the vineyard with a bucket of water, looking for those branches that have grown along the ground. We lift them up and wash them off, and then we wrap them around the trellis or tie them up. And pretty soon, they're thriving. I wonder if that is what Jesus has in mind in this story. Jesus is the vine, we are the branches, but sometimes we are like those low-lying branches trailing along the ground. Our leaves over time become coated with dirt, and when it rains in our lives, we get coated with mud and mildew. At such times, we are incapable of bearing fruit and lifting ourselves up. It's not that we don't want to bear fruit, we just can't do it. So what does the owner of the vineyard do with us? Does he cut us off and throw us into the fire? No, we are much too valuable for that. Instead, he tenderly lifts us up, washes us off, and places us on a higher part of the vine where we can thrive again and again. Isn't that a magnificent picture of what Jesus does in our lives? You see, we usually hang on to the word sin to describe our natural tendency to trail down and grow along the ground. Sin is the go-to word for us when we need to explain whatever mess we find ourselves in or to explain away terrible things that we simply cannot get our heads around. Have you ever noticed the language we use when someone is barely hanging on? They might even be like the vine who's dragging along the ground in the dust and dirt, gathering mud along each step of every day to the point that everything feels overwhelmingly heavy and crushing and inescapable. And what do we say to that person? We offer the ubiquitous, hang in there, which, what does that even mean? It doesn't seem to be very helpful advice for one who desperately wonders how to do just that. Moreover, surely Jesus is offering us so much more than the bumper sticker theology of just hang in there. I mean, Jesus isn't saying life isn't hard or that every day will be a walk in the park, but I don't also hear him saying hang in there either. I do hear him saying that even when, and perhaps even especially when, our lives get hard, that living and abiding and finding our home in him, the vine, and God, the vine grower, will sustain us and lift us up and promote us to even greater well-being. I think this is close to the Hebrew notion of shalom that points us to wholeness and completeness and health, or at least something approaching each of these things. I think embracing shalom in our lives is what enables us to speak of healing when there doesn't appear to be a cure and hope even when there is suffering and bearing fruit even in the midst of decay. You see, in the hands of Jesus, all that is extraneous is carefully and lovingly removed. What remains is centered and focused in God. As Jesus counsels and prays with his disciples, he invites them to stay close to him by placing their trust in him. He warns them that they cannot go it alone, trusting in their own strength and power. On their own, they would be cut off from their life source. They would bear no fruit. And this is a word that followers need to heed today. The temptation to go it alone in our own or on our own is pervasive in our culture. We live in a society that promotes independence and making something of yourself. Though a valid goal, self-worth often becomes equated with our own success and what we by ourselves can produce. And it becomes very easy to think that it is all up to us and our own resources as we try to solve problems and meet challenges. John Bell and Graham Maul remind us of the seduction of rugged individualism uh, when they write in their song, I am the vine. For on your own, what can you dare? 
Left to yourself, no sap you share. Branches that serve their own desire find themselves broken as fuel for fire. God, as master gardener, offers a better plan for our lives. Let us find our home in God's word and place our trust there. The harvest will be bountiful. As the chorus of the above song reminds us, I am the vine and you are the branches, pruned and prepared for all to see, chosen to bear the fruit of heaven if you remain and trust in me. Amen. Alive in the risen Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit, we bring our prayers before God, who promises to hear us and answer in steadfast love. God of all fruitfulness, you abide in your church, and your church abides in you. Cleanse us by your word and give yourself to the whole church on earth, so that it bears fruit and witnesses to your love. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You have created the heavens and the earth. As we wonder at the beauty of creation, may we seek vital connections among all that depends on the earth for life. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You rule the nations with justice and love. Give the leaders of the earth assurance of your abiding presence, that they lead not by fear, but with love for those they are called to serve. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You have loved us so that we can love others. We pray for all in need of your love, those who are poor, lowly, outcast, weak, or fearful. Provide for the needs of all, especially those we name aloud or in the silence of our heart. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. You gather us with all the saints by the power of your Spirit. With them may our hearts live forever in your keeping. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. 
In the hope of new life in Christ, we praise our prayers, we raise our prayers to you, trusting in your never-ending goodness and mercy, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always, and also with you. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts, we lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our honor and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, for the glorious resurrection of our Savior Jesus Christ, the true Paschal Lamb who gave himself to take away our sin, who in dying has destroyed death and in rising has brought us to eternal life. And so with Mary Magdalene and Peter and all the witnesses of the resurrection, with earth and sea and all their creatures, and with angels and archangels, cherubim and seraphim, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Holy, mighty, and merciful Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. And great love you sent to us, Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who, on the cross, opened his arms to all. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks and broke it, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death and resurrection and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of those of all who share this heavenly food, the body and blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. These are the fruits of God for the people of God. Come to the table. All are welcome for the gifts of God are free. Amen.
Let us pray. Life-giving God, in the mystery of Christ's resurrection, you send light to conquer darkness, water to give new life, and the bread of life to nourish your people. Send us forth as witnesses to your Son's resurrection, that we may show your glory to all the world. Through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace, share the good news. Thanks be to God.
Thank you.